I am here with Dr. Aaron Champagne, Professor of Philosophy, St. Louis Community College, Merrimack. Thank you, Dr. Champagne, for joining me and talking with me today about the epistemology of testimony. So before you start teaching us what the epistemology of testimony is all about, I was hoping you can just break down what epistemology is in the first place. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so epistemology comes to us from two Greek words, episteme and ology. Episteme means knowledge and ology, like in biology, uh, means the study of, right? So uh, epistemology is just the study of knowledge. Um, uh, more specifically, uh, epistemologists look at the nature of knowledge, uh, the extent of our knowledge, and uh, the origins of our knowledge. So there's kind of like three big questions within epistemology. Uh, again, like one is like, what is knowledge in the first place? The other one is uh, like, you know, do we even have knowledge? Uh, and then finally, uh, there's the question of uh, the, the origins of our knowledge, the sources of our knowledge. If we do have knowledge, in other words, um, where does it come from? So, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, interesting. Okay, I was hoping you would apply that uh, to testimony. Right. Are you applying all three of those to testimony? Well, you, um, you could apply all three to testimony. Um, you could certainly, when it comes to the second question, do we have knowledge, you could apply it to uh, testimony. You might, for example, um, think that testimony cannot give us knowledge. I would say that most people in, uh, that are working in the epistemology of testimony assume that testimony uh, can give us knowledge, okay? Um, and so I would say that the, the, the main questions within the field fall under that third question about, uh, again, what uh, is kind of like, what is the source of our knowledge, right? So um, perception seems to be uh, one source of knowledge. When I look out my window and I see a tree, uh, it seems like I can, you know, I can come to know that there's a tree there, right? Like that's, that's perception uh, serving as a source of our knowledge. When I, like right now, I have this kind of mental image of myself uh, eating pizza last night for at dinner, right? Okay. So I can recall that right now. And right now through memory, I can know that last night I was uh, eating dinner for pizza, right? Okay. So then testimony is kind of uh, in, in the same spirit here. Like what we're asking is, well, can testimony do the same thing uh, at that uh, memory or perception, for example, can do? That is, can it be a source of knowledge? Could it be a source of justification? And I think that, again, most people working in this area think that it can be. And I think intuitively, that, that strikes us as correct, right? So like, look, in fact, I think most of what people believe and most of what we know is based on testimony, right? Um, so let me just think about like the ubiquity of it. So I um, believe that uh, more than 500,000 Americans have died from the coronavirus, right? That's something, I haven't counted these people up myself. That's something that other people have told me. Right. right. Um, I believe that uh, my brother thinks that the Cubs are going to win the World Series this year. Well, I can't get into his head. He, he, he's told me that that's what he believes. There's certain facts about ourselves that we can only believe on the basis of testimony. I, I believe that I was born on May 29th. Well, I, I don't remember that. I mean, right. I don't remember wow. that. That's that's based on my birth certificate. And then there's lots of other things like scientific facts that um, Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system. That's testimony. Human beings are co composed of DNA. I know that if I know it through testimony. Um, historical things, right? Whatever. The, the French Revolution occurred in 1789. Like, I, I don't get any of it uh, without testimony. So I think that, um, again, one of the things that's motivating people within this literature is to try to explain how it is that we uh, come to have knowledge through testimony. And by the way, I should say here, uh, because I didn't uh, yet, 
uh, when this terminology is not great, when we talk about testimony, we're not, ta- we're not restricting uh, this to uh, legal testimony. We mean like just what other people tell you. And that could be verbally, that could be in written form, it could be through like nonverbal signals, like a nod, for example, uh, that would all count as, um, as testimony. And so basically then the epistemology of testimony, to answer your uh, original question, is essentially an attempt to describe um, how or why uh, we come to know things on the basis of other people say so. Interesting. So can you talk to me now about how we might distribute our knowledge through testimony? Do you, do you want to maybe start with what people say and then help me understand whether you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is actually one of the central debates within the epistemology of testimony, this kind of debate between whether or not testimony uh, merely transmits uh, knowledge or if it can generate knowledge. And so the really the main question here to make it a little bit uh, more precise is um, in order for, that, that's right, in order for um, a hearer to come to know something, uh, to come to know the, the content of a speaker's report, the question is, must the speaker herself know uh, that to which she attests? Right? So if you think that the speaker must know the content of her report in order for the hearer to know the content of the report, then you think that uh, that testimony merely transmits knowledge or merely transmits justification. On the other hand, if you think that the speaker need not know uh, the content of her report in order for the hearer to come to know the content of the report, then you would think that testimony can generate um, justification or knowledge. Mm-hmm. So there should be, maybe we can start with a couple of cases here, okay? And then I can kind of talk about like maybe the intuitive pull that the transmission view has and then maybe some counter examples to it. So like if you're walking down the street and you see, um, you see your neighbor and your neighbor says, um, you know, there's a car accident down the street and you have really good evidence for thinking that your neighbor is sincere and competent, especially when it comes to mundane matters like car accidents. That seems like a straightforward case in which you get testimonial knowledge, right, from your, um, from your neighbor. Okay. Um, but now contrast that case with the following case. Same setup, basically, except that um, your neighbor on this occasion just was guessing that there was a car accident down the street. Okay. So, like, he's generally uh, reliable, generally credible, generally sincere. But this time he was just guessing. Okay. And now suppose that um, he, he guessed right. It it was actually true that there was a car accident down the street, okay? Now, um, if you're like me, then you're a lot more suspicious about whether or not you, in the example, gain testimonial knowledge, right, Uh, that there was a car accident down the street. That seems to be kind of like a lucky guess, Mm. okay? So that should give you some, I think, intuitive pull towards um, the transmission view. Again, the transmission view just says in order for uh, the hearer to know something, the speaker's got to know uh, as well. Okay. That's roughly the view. Um, here's more kind of intuitive pull for it. Like I can't give you a gift if I have nothing to give you. So the, the, the hearer can't get something that speaker doesn't have. And if the speaker doesn't have um, knowledge or justification, then the idea is, again, that uh, the hearer can't have it either. Okay, so that's kind of like the transmission view and some like, I think, uh, again, intuitive pull in that direction. But there's been some really clever uh, counter examples to this. Um, and maybe we can talk about uh, two of them. Both of these are due to a philosopher named Jennifer Lackey. Um, and, and I think that these, I don't know if these are decisive, but I think that they're they're pretty darn good. Okay, so here's here's the first one. This is what she calls um, creationist teacher. All right. So here's the setup. Um, there's a sixth grade science teacher named Stella, 
Um, Stella teaches evolutionary theory. She uh, knows a lot about it, right? She knows a lot about, she read all the textbooks. Uh, she's uh, updated her lecture notes and so forth, right? Okay. However, she has all these, she has religious commitments. Okay, that's why it's called creationist teacher. So she believes in creationism, not evolution. All right. Nevertheless, um, during one of her lessons, she says to her class that um, Homo sapiens evolved from Homo, Homo erectus. Okay, and let's suppose that the students uh, come to believe this. Okay, now it surely seems, at least intuitively, that the students can gain testimonial knowledge there, right? Um, mm. But here's the problem. Um, Stella doesn't have testimonial knowledge because she doesn't believe in evolution. She rejects the claim that uh, Homo sapiens evolved from Homo erectus. And then um, once you figure in that belief is a component of knowledge, which is a, what most epistemologists believe, uh, then it looks like we have a case in which the hearer, in this case, the student, uh, has testimonial knowledge, but uh, the speaker does not. Okay. So that's a counter example to the idea you were giving us called the transmission view, which requires a speaker to know in order for their testimony to transmit knowledge to some hearer. That's exactly right. Uh, that's exactly right. So what, mm -hmm. uh, what Lackey and what uh, people that endorse the generation view say is, look, in that kind of case, um, testimonial knowledge can be generated. Right? And that Basically, helps us understand this debate then? That's right. That's right. So again, um, it might have seemed as if that transmission view seemed correct. And I have to say, it still seems correct to me in some way. Um, but, I, but I do think that uh, the transmission view or the proponent of that view needs to sort of uh, deal with uh, that that counter example. And here's, an, here's another one. It's a little bit different, but the, the point's the same. So uh, in this case, we might suppose that a woman named Millie um, visits uh, her eye doctor and her eye doctor has told her that her uh, visual capacities have been compromised, okay? But nevertheless, she ignores uh, the eye doctor's uh, testimony there and keeps forming and believing. Uh, she keeps forming uh, perceptual beliefs and, and endorses them, accepts them, right? Okay, but now suppose that for some reason the eye doctor got it wrong uh, in this case, right? He's normally reliable. Mm -hmm. She knows that he's normally reliable. Uh, but this time he got it wrong. So all of her perceptual beliefs are, uh, or nearly all of them are veridical. Okay. They're, uh, she's, she's seeing real things. Okay. So let's just suppose then that she sees whatever, a badger in her backyard. Okay. And then she reports that to her friend, call him Bob. All right. Um, now it, once again, intuitively, it seems as if Bob can come to know that Millie saw a uh, badger in her backyard. And if, it's true, of course, that she did, okay? But on the other hand, she didn't know that because the, uh, the eye doctor's testimony defeated her justification. And that just means that she has counter evidence for thinking that um, her perceptual faculties are reliable. She, she should believe that they're unreliable. Right. So once again, we have a situation in which the here in question, in this case, Bob, has uh, or at least intuitively seems to have knowledge. And yet the speaker in question, uh, Millie, does not have knowledge because she's not justified in believing as she does. So assume that we can know things and that we can transmit what we know through testimony but does it matter what kind of information, like scientific knowledge or moral knowledge or aesthetic knowledge? Could you tell me about some of these kinds of nuances? Yeah, sure. So um, this is actually, uh, there's some recent literature here on just how far um, testimonial knowledge can extend, right? So again, as I mentioned at the outset here, I think that most epistemologists believe that um, testimony can be a source of knowledge, 
but just because it can be a source of knowledge for very mundane matters doesn't mean that it's a source of knowledge for more interesting matters like um, like uh, moral testimony and, or moral knowledge and aesthetic knowledge. Okay, so there is some work being done on on each of these. Okay, so here's basically the idea. Let's suppose that you know I think of you as um, a very thoughtful person and um, a very conscientious person. You're a philosopher. You've thought a lot about these ethical matters, and you tell me that um, uh, eating meat is morally wrong. Okay, so that would be uh, an instance of uh, of moral testimony. And so then the question is. Um, can I come to know just on the basis of your testimony that eating meat is morally wrong, right? And so something similar then would apply to um, uh, aesthetic testimony, right? If you were to tell me that uh, uh, Monet's water lilies are beautiful, can I come to know that proposition just on the basis of your testimony? I think that the majority of people, at least initially working in this area of moral testimony and aesthetic uh, testimony, um, <laughs> wanted to be kind of like pessimists, right? That is, I mean, it just seems odd to us to say that I can acquire knowledge about some moral matter on the basis of your testimony, no matter how reliable you are in the matter, right? Um, but it's proven to be somewhat difficult to kind of find reasons for pessimism, or at least good reasons for pessimism. So, you know, like some people have argued that, look, I mean, I can't get, in order for me to know that um, eating meat is morally wrong, I would have to like know that, um, you know, eating meat causes pain to animals or unnecessary harm to animals and causing unnecessary harm is wrong. And of course, testimony can't give me that, it's alleged. Um, because then it would fail to be a testimonial belief. It would be like an inferential belief, right? I, I think that optimism is probably true, um, strictly speaking. I do think that, um, that moral testimony can transmit knowledge, but I think it's pretty limited. So, so here's one example, and I don't think that this is maybe the best example of moral of secondhand moral knowledge, but it's one that um, that uh, is arguably a case of um, of uh, secondhand moral knowledge. And this is due to, or an example like this is due to Karen Jones, who's a, um, a philosopher. So um, the idea is this: suppose that um, suppose that you're friends with Samantha and Sam, and they're work colleagues. Okay, and um, you're in meetings with them a lot. Uh, and you you know each one of them, and there's not a really good relationship between Samantha and Sam. And one day Samantha confides to you that um, she thinks that uh, Sam is sexist, uh, in part because he often mansplains um, to women, including her. Okay. Now um, that strikes me as a case in which, if that is um, moral knowledge, there that it can be transmitted. Um, because um, Samantha might be in a better position than you are to see, especially if you are male, um, to see that someone else, another man is mansplaining, okay? Um, is that a case of, of secondhand moral knowledge? I, I don't know, I'm, I'm not sure, but if it is, I do think that in that case, it can be transmitted. I also think that um, if you think about the way that children learn about morality, that strikes me as another situation in which um, uh, moral testimony can be, or moral knowledge can be transmitted. So again, if uh, whatever, if a mother tells her child that uh, hurting people is morally wrong, I do think that then the child can gain moral knowledge on the basis of the mother's uh, testimony of her words. But I think that things become a lot more interesting once we focus on a, um, clear cases of, of moral testimony, and B, once we focus on what might be called mature epistemic agents, people that are kind of aware, unlike children, of the controversies surrounding most moral claims. So look, I mean, 
um, as much trust that I'm uh, as I may have in you as a, a thoughtful person, as a moral philosopher, and so forth. If you just tell me that eating meat is morally wrong, um, uh, look, I'm going to have a I'm going to have a recognition that that's a very controversial matter. And in my view, I think that um, that that recognition will actually serve to defeat, um, to undermine the claim. So um, maybe I otherwise would have been, a, if I had been like a child, maybe I could have uh, uh, gotten moral knowledge that way through your testimony, right? But because I know that there's a lot of controversy surrounding that, that, that there's a lot of disagreement about, um, about that moral matter, about vegetarianism, um, I'm certainly, that's going to prevent me from believing it. So uh, there's no way I would believe it anyway. And I don't think it takes to a professional philosopher either um, to uh, be in that position, right? I mean, I think most people even, you know, I mean, um, I, I don't know what at, at what age this would be, but I, I think that there's, a you know, uh, a level of maturity that uh, comes pretty soon um, where that, you know, people just wouldn't accept uh, that claim on its face. So is scientific knowledge easier to transmit through testimony because there's less controversy or, or, or less disagreement? Because you, you're mentioning disagreement and controversy. Right. And, I'm, and I'm trying to parse the different kinds of information that might get transmitted through testimony. And if you only have one guardian and they're telling you eating meat is wrong, um, even if you are a mature agent, are you thinking, well, the world is going to influence you and show you the complexity of things? Well, I mean, I do think that there's some scientific knowledge, uh, knowledge or some scientific testimony that is more easily transmitted than moral or aesthetic testimony. But of course, it depends. I mean, you know, if someone is um, talking about the beginnings of the universe um, to a to an epistemic uh, to a mature epistemic agent, if someone tells me that the uh, multiverse theory is the is the <laughs> is the correct uh, theory about the beginning of the universe, um, I'm not going to once again accept that on its face because I know that there's some kind of uh, controversy there. And I actually, you know, I don't think that I have to know a whole lot about about the different theories. It's almost just like a recognition that this is not the only accepted view. Right. And I don't mean to suggest that this is just like a lack of consensus or that like the disagreement has to be um, like 50 50 on both sides or something. But again, it's just this sheer um, recognition that uh, that there is this a lot of disagreement around the matter that would prevent me from, again, just accepting what someone is telling me um, on its face. Or here's perhaps a better example. I mean, if someone were to tell me that. Um, Maybe I already said this, but like if someone were to tell me that uh, crime in the 1990s um, was significantly uh, reduced because um, abortion was legalized in the 1970s, which is one of the, the theories regarding for why there was a, a reduction in crime in, in the United States in the 1990s. Uh, again, I'm not going to just believe that because I know that that's just kind of, again, just one theory that's trying to explain why crime uh, uh, lessened during that time. So what do you think is, let, let's satisfy the conditions you set out. So imagine we're dealing with a mature epistemic agent. What is a clear example of the transmission of knowledge through testimony? Um, well, I think there's clear cases with mundane matters. Um, again, uh, you know, whatever you, you have a friend that, uh, that's your neighbor, you trust this person, uh, whatever. And, uh, he's a, he's a reliable, uh, baseball fan. And he tells you that, uh, the Cardinals won three to two last night. Well, I mean, I think that's a pretty clear case in which, uh, t uh, testimony can be transmitted from one person to, to another, but I, I guess what I would say is I'm less convinced that, 
when it comes to mature epistemic agents that anyone can believe something controversial on the basis of someone else's say so. Hmm. And I think that, so that doesn't necessarily uh, rule out moral aesthetic testimony or religious testimony for that matter. Um, but it does rule out a bunch of it, right? Because a lot, so there's obviously, I think there's some moral claims, for example, um, that are not, um, that are not controversial. Like maybe, maybe causing unnecessary pain is wrong. Maybe that's an uncontroversial uh, moral claim. And maybe then a mature epistemic agent, if he or she had not thought about that before, could maybe, uh, could maybe come to know it on the basis of someone else's say so. But again, I think that because most or a good chunk of moral, aesthetic, uh, religious claims and so forth, because they are, con it, it's not because they're moral, aesthetic, religious, or whatever the case is, it's because they're controversial. I think that's what, um, uh, that, that's what prevents uh, a hearer from coming to know those things on the basis of testimony. So is that what someone would point at if they're trying to argue you can't get knowledge from testimony? Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. So, I mean, here's another example, philosophical knowledge, right? Um, like suppose that you were at a conference with a few of your colleagues. And again, these are people that you, uh, that you trust um, and people that are more knowledgeable about you in certain areas, right? Like, um, you know, suppose I have a colleague that's much more knowledgeable about uh, the free will literature, for example, than I am, okay? Um, and suppose then that um, whatever, he goes to a talk, uh, a talk that I didn't myself go to and comes back from the talk and, and says, um, whatever, Professor X, uh, has proven that human beings have free will and meant it like, I don't believe that he proved that, but meant it as, oh yeah, human beings have free will. I mean, no matter how <laughs> knowledgeable uh, and reliable my colleague is, I don't think that I'm just going to accept uh, at his word that human beings uh, have free will. Because again, I know that there's uh, a lot of uh, discussion about this, right? Uh, and And part of the thing is it's not just sheer disagreement it's that people might mean different things about uh, about human freedom and so i have to I, I i'm that's kind of in the back of my mind as well and so again once again that's what's preventing me from from accepting that and, uh, and the same goes with again like religious claims right you, you're not just gonna believe because someone tells you no matter how reliable they are that god exists um you know you're gonna want to kind of work that out for yourself and and once you do that of course that's what prevents it from being a testimonial belief Interesting. So probably a lot has to do with the subject we're thinking about and yeah. how gullible they are, how much trust they have. Yeah, right. I mean, I think that's what's motivating the pessimist in the first place, mm -hmm. right? Like, I don't want, <laughs> you don't want to be so gullible as to believe anything about any matter. And it doesn't have to be about uh, about just like about moral or aesthetic or religious testimony. It could be about like, um, you know, you don't want to like just believe that some guy comes up to you and says, uh, yeah, I saw a UFO in my backyard uh, last night. I mean, it, it surely strikes most people, I think, as pretty gullible if you were just to believe that, uh, to believe that individual. That makes sense. Okay, so as my last question, I'll just ask you to add anything that we haven't covered about the epistemology of testimony that somebody interested in it should think about? Yeah, so, I mean, I would say the only thing, um, you know, or at least one of the main things that um, uh, generated the, the discussion regarding, or kind of the, the literature on epistemolo uh, epistemology of testimony was um, this kind of debate between what's called reductionism and non-reductionism. And um, it kind of has, it stretches back to some modern philosophy. Uh, but basically, the idea there is um, whether or not you need to have like good non-testimonially based reasons for accepting someone else's report, okay, or whether or not you can just believe the report um, on its face. That is, um, 
one position, which is called reductionism, says I need to have positive reasons, right? Non-testimonial reasons for thinking that you're reliable. Okay. So the default position is kind of like non-acceptance, right? And then I can accept what you're saying only if I have good evidence for, for thinking that, um, that you're reliable. Um, and, and it kind of, I think what motivates that position is this idea that we don't want to be uh, gullible, right? Mm. Um, on the other hand, there's other folks that are called non-reductionists where the default position is more like one of acceptance. And you come off that default position if there's counter evidence. So I should just accept what you say um, at face value unless I see some counter evidence for thinking that you're reliable, if I think that maybe you're lying here or that you could be mistaken about the matter. Uh, and so that um, uh, that's kind of um, occupied a central place within the epistemology of testimony. Um, and uh, you know, I have, um, I have some sympathies with non-reductionism, but um, we could save that for another time. Well, just to close, why are you on that side? Or what's the pull? Um, the pull, I think, for any non-reductionist is to account for, again, the ubiquity of what seems to be testimonial knowledge in the first place. The, pr the problem with reductionism has always been that it makes testimonial knowledge too hard to come by, right? So, like, it seems like I got to, like, verify, right, uh, every single individual's reports and corroborate the reports with reality in order to get testimony and knowledge in the first place, uh, non-reductionism doesn't, of course, have that uh, implication. And so that's kind of the, I think that's the main motivator for non-reductionism. Of course, you have to, again, worry about that potential gullibility problem uh, that all non-reductionists have to, um, to deal with. But um, that's, I think, um, again, why I'm attracted to non-reductionism in the first place.